I'd like to take this time to introduce our moderator for today, Myrna Norman. And really the whole concept for this event and this idea came from Myrna. So I will let Myrna speak more about it and kind of how it came to be. Um, but I would like to share that Myrna has been a really key partner on several projects and committees here at the RIA, but also beyond that. Um, she is an incredibly passionate and active advocate for people living with dementia and basically just an all around lovely person. <laughs> so whenever we're on a Zoom call or on a meeting, she always brings such great energy to the group and puts a smile on people's face. So Myrna, we're so happy to have you here today as our moderator, and we're happy to be able to support this event and you know really bring your idea to life. So I will hand it over to you. Wow. I don't know how I'm ever going to live up to that. Um, these people that are on this panel and those that will be on the panels to come have so much wonderful information to share with you just to build our community. Um, and that's what we want to do. I, I want to start by reading a poem and I really considered whether or not to do this because it's kind of sad. Uh, but I want you to hear it. The author is unknown. And when we've completed that, this uh, poem, then we'll get right on with all the panels. So here I go. When I wander, don't tell me to come and sit down. Wander with me. It may be because I'm hungry or thirsty or need the toilet, or maybe I just need to stretch my legs. When I call for my mother, even though I'm 90, don't tell me that she's dead. Reassure me, hug me, ask me about her. It may be I'm looking for that security that my mother once gave me. When I shout out, don't ask me to be quiet or walk past me. I'm trying to tell you something, but I have difficulty in telling you what I want. Be patient, try and find out. I might be in pain. When I become agitated and appear angry, please don't automatically reach for the drugs. I'm trying to tell you something. I may be too hot or too cold or it's too bright or too noisy, or maybe it's because I miss my loved ones so much. And I may not know how to cope with that. When I don't eat my dinner or drink my tea, it may be because I've forgotten how. Show me what to do and remind me. It may be that I just need to hold my life, that I need you to hold my knife and fork and show me what to do. When I push you away for trying to help me wash or get dressed, maybe it's because I've forgotten what you're doing. Keep telling me over and over and over what you're doing at the time. Maybe others will think that you need help, but please go ahead and tell me. With all my thoughts and maybes, perhaps it will be you who reaches into my thoughts, understands my fears, and will make me feel safe. It may be you who I need to thank. Thank you very much. Isn't that amazing? So first of all, I wanna start introducing my panel. Um, and with the introductions, you guys get like seven and a half seconds to tell us about yourself. A little more, I think. Uh, so I'm going to go by my screen and Debbie, you're first up there. Debbie, could you tell us a bit about yourself? Okay, I'm Debbie. I live in Hamilton, Ontario. I was diagnosed at the age of 58 about four years ago with young onset Alzheimer's and I am now an uh, advocate uh, locally, nationally and internationally. Wonderful. Sandra? Hi, my name is Sandra. I live in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uh, I was diagnosed after three years of uh, testing. Uh, with Lewy body dementia with Parkinson's and I'm a very happy person to be able to be on this panel today. Mm -hmm. Bill, oh Bill, your turn. <laughs> I'm uh, Bill Heibine. Uh, I have a farm. I live about 45 kilometers west of Thunder Bay and um, I'm in my 23rd year of living extremely well with a death with a uh, uh, definition of um, Alzheimer's. Originally, the diagnosis was early onset Alzheimer's. So that's been the uh, diagnosis I've been living with for the last 23 and a half years. Wow. Donna? Um, <laughs> um, I have uh, Alzheimer's disease as well. And uh, I was diagnosed back in, back in 2014. And um, 
it, it is what it is, right? We uh, we've all sort of had to make um, adjustments to our life, and uh, so far it's been uh, some days are better than others, but the, I'm still having better days than bad ones. So. Awesome, Len Carter. Um, my name is Len Carter. I'm uh, older than most of you, and I'm uh, I have vascular dementia. And, was given the diagnosis was given to me several years ago. I was most unhappy with the diagnosis, and I've become somewhat of an advocate, as, as some of the people on the on the uh, on the calls note. I have a, a fair bit of experience, a fair bit of education, and uh, an immense interest. Thanks, Len. So, see what a talented panel. So I'm not going to do much talking, I hope, um, and let the panel talk about the things that they want to say. I wanted first to ask the panel, um, is there one thing that you could tell this audience that would help um, close the awkwardness between us, those of us with dementia, and our community? Can we start with uh, Debbie? One of the things that I would suggest is that people who think they know about dementia and what they perceive dementia to be, uh, to just wipe that out of their heads um, or take it from their minds. There's a lot of misconceptions about the various stages of dementia and it's a stumbling block for making um, communities inclusive. There's a lot more that we have to offer. And just because we got a diagnosis one day, it doesn't mean our, we're not um, useful the next day. Wow, thanks. Sandra. Hi, what I would like to offer is uh, similar to what Debbie has said, is we all have dementia, but we're still people behind it. We didn't change from the day before on the, to the day of that we were ranting lunatics or belonged in a locked room. We are still people and we have lots to give. And there are many stages of dementia and we're all on a different journey. And just to remember that. Thanks, Sandra. Uh, Bill? Well, I guess one of the first things I would have to say is don't always listen to your doctor. Um, in my particular situation, um, at the time I was diagnosed, they told me because of an early diagnosis and on medication very quickly, I might get five good years. At the end of five years, I would probably end up in a home somewhere. After eight years had gone by, they ran me through every test in the book again. This time I was given the same diagnosis, early onset Alzheimer's, but I was told because I was in my eighth year, I would be lucky to get three more. Well, five years ago, they ran me through every test in the book again. And this time they said, they don't know what you're doing, but whatever it is, don't stop. And I am firmly of the belief, if I did it yesterday, there's no reason I can't do it today. And if I'm doing it today, there's no reason I can't do it tomorrow. Thanks. Donna. Well, I guess the, the only advice I could give to anybody or sort of what I've gone through is sort of things is that um, for me in particular, be nice to people. Because if you're not nice to people, they're not going to be nice back to you, no matter whether you have Alzheimer's or not. So I find it's a lot easier if um, if I just stay cool and, and that sort of thing. But I do tell most people, um, and I shouldn't say I do tell them, but I wait until there's an opportunity for me to slide in about Alzheimer's while I'm talking to them. Because I think, truly, I think we're, we've all got this just so that we can alert other folks to Alzheimer's, just in case, right? Because when we when we first were, even before we were diagnosed, we were really scared about what was happening to us and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so I take advantage of those opportunities when people ask, strangers ask me about Alzheimer's and that sort of stuff, and, and try to be as positive on about it as possible, but as realistic as well. So, well, thank you, and Lynn, you've muted Lynn. Sorry, I was behaving. Okay. Um, it was a mistake. It won't happen again. <laughs> uh, the, the, what I can tell you best about this, about this condition, and I call it a condition, 
is that, first of all, there are over 107 different um, dementias. So you, you're not alone. Believe me, you're not alone. There's, there's, there's thousands and thousands, there's a million people in, in Canada alone that are affected. So the other thing is, the best way to, to, uh, to beat this is to reach out, to talk to people, to, to touch people, to have uh, conversations, to, to be comfortable. You're a person. Uh, all those other people are persons as well. So just talk to them. Thank you, Lynn. All of those things are so important. And um, as, as Lynn ended that conversation with, we're all people. So um, we want to say hello to you and we want to hear you say hello back. Let's talk a little bit now about our diagnosis. We have an idea of how long ago we've been diagnosed and, and, and sort of a tough period. But I want to know a bit more about that diagnosis. Debbie, we'll start with you. Okay. Um, I was not shocked at the diagnosis because I'd cared for seven family members over the last 40 years with uh, Alzheimer's and Lewy body. Um, what took me surprise, um, even though I'm a social worker and I have a lot of strategies in place to, to help deal with situations, I went on an 18 month journey where I absolutely let dementia take control of my life. I was absolutely de uh, devastated at my emotional responses. I actually became suicidal, um, something that a lot of people don't talk about, but when you're in peer-to-peer -peer support groups, it's a topic of discussion. Um, and so that journey, it was like being on a roller coaster, but I wasn't inside the car. I was tethered by a strap hitting the trestles, and that's how I described it. Uh, I had seven stove fires prior to my diagnosis diagnosis, I had to call the fire department, all these little teeny tiny signs and symptoms that happened to you before, um, I didn't pick up on. And the best thing I could have done was to have gotten in touch with the Alzheimer Society, my local chapter here in Hamilton, because they were able to put me in touch with um, people that were doing surveys and a little bit of research. And when I wanted to volunteer with them, I thought I'd be answering the phone. Um, you know, stuffing envelopes. Two weeks later, I'm involved in a project. Four years later, I'm busier than I am than I was working. Like it's, it's incredible, the, the confidence. And I looked at something called the three C's. I mourned all my losses. It took 18 months. The life that I knew, the present life and my future were gone as far as I was concerned. Working through those and then, um, being in touch, as Len said, get the support that you need. So important. Family can help to a certain degree with best intentions, but we need professional help. Wow. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you so much. Sandra, can you share with us what it was like with your diagnosis? As I said earlier, uh, I was 52 when I first started going to the memory clinic. And it took three years. I was passing the test easily, no problem. And thankfully for me, my doctor knew that I was an accountant and I consulting and I did it internationally. So I had to know all the all the tax laws, all the accounting laws and everything that was happening in the world. And I could not do that anymore. It was just like slowly it just it was gone you know what used to take me a half hour was taking me three and a half hours so there was something wrong and I really believe that the uh the mini test that they do is meant for people in the later stages and not for people with young onset so you know they, they can't diagnose you don't get to see a neurologist unless you you beg for one and finally, uh, I, did, I did get diagnosed after I got to see the neurologist and I was just having a hard time remembering. I had, you know, a, almost a photographic memory before and then all of a sudden I just didn't know how to do things on my own without my brain to tell me automatically what it was. 
my focus and concentration became impacted. And I just forgot how to do things. And one day I just decided, you know, my car, I realized my car does not drive itself because it did not know how to go to my clients' businesses. And so I knew I couldn't say it was the car's fault, <laughs> even though you, everyone thinks the car knows how to get there. But I was, as I said, I was a lucky, one of the lucky ones. My doctor knew what I was like before and what I had become. Um, financially, I was not able to get any disability and had to go into the system, as they say, because you can't get anything with disability until you're diagnosed. So that was three hard years. Mm -hmm. um, that's it for now. Thank you for sharing. Often it's painful for us to share these things or it brings them right back to the front. Um, and so all that you're sharing is so terribly valuable. Bill, you've shared a little bit about um, your diagnosis and what you had to go through to keep it going. What were the initial things that, that you thought something was wrong? Well, I guess um, there are a couple of things that sort of showed up for me. One was, as you, some of you have heard before, at the time I was diagnosed, I was a partner with Ernst & Young. And um, my main area of supposed expertise was farm and agricultural taxation. I used to do a lot of lecturing for the ministry, Ontario Ministry of Agriculture on farm tax. And um, I would notice that during some of the lectures, I would completely lose my train of thought, even though there was something on the screen I'd be talking about. Well, I found that very easy to cover because all I did was ask someone in the audience if they had a specific tax problem they wanted to talk about. So I was able to switch back to whatever it was they brought forward to me. That's how I covered that end of it. The other portion of it was occurring in the office. Um, I would find that my secretary would come in and say, you've got a meeting at two o'clock. Uh, she'd come in quarter to two. Well, why aren't you going across town to the meeting? Well, I'd forgotten that I had a meeting. So that was another thing showing up. In addition, my wife was noticing things, starting to, uh, I missed things or was repeating things around the house. Now, at the time I was diagnosed, I was eligible for early retirement. And I thought, well, if I've got five years left, five good years left, I'm not gonna spend it behind a desk. I immediately took early retirement and at that time, my wife and I owned and operated Amethyst Farms, under which name we have bred, trained, and shown registered quarter horses. I've shown Manitoba, Minnesota, Northwestern Ontario, this area. And I think when I look back on it, part of the reason why um, apparently I've been told I went into a deep depression at the time I was diagnosed and took retirement. Um, when I think about it, horses to some degree saved me in that at the time of diagnosis, we had 11 horses in the barn. Three of my mares were due to full within a three month period. I had no time to feel sorry for myself. So I went overnight from being a full-time accountant and a morning and evening horse feeder and a weekend farmer to being a seven day a week farmer. And in that aspect, what I do, and I'm doing it today, what I do is very, very um, recurring, repetitive. I know when I get up in the morning what I have to do that day. And I think that in itself has helped me get through the last 23 years. Wow. Wow. I just want to give another wow. It's so <laughs> Donna, what yeah. about you? Me? Um, yeah. Mm. What was the diagnosis like? Oh, the diagnosis, actually, I had, uh, after the operation was finished, I had a, a hip replacement. After that hip replacement, um, the following week or so, I found that I could remember a darn thing. And so I went back to the doctor, like freaking out because I couldn't remember anything. And um, they said that, yeah, it's a possibility you had too much anesthetic. So from a hip replacement surgery. So, so that's where I got my little friend from. <laughs> Did you then follow that up with a neurologist? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how, how did that go? The same thing. It's just, we can't do anything about it. Um, it's, it's a done deal, but yeah, just, he just confirmed what, what it, 
what had happened and what I thought was the was the cause of my Alzheimer's. And had you had they told you that that was a possibility before? They had, but I hadn't pushed it because it didn't. I didn't sort of feel like I was needed anything that that I didn't didn't think I really needed any any more support than I had. But uh, but after the hip the replacement that that finished it a couple of uh, one month after the hip replacement, um, I could not remember anything, and it's been that way ever since, pretty much. Wow. Mm -hmm. Just. Before we go to Len, we've got a couple of questions. I don't know who came up first. Paul, we'll ask you. I don't have a question. What I have is uh, two things. Uh, one, when I first talked to my family doctor, who I knew for over 30 years, he's like a friend, uh, that I had all these symptoms, forgetful, confusion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, he called me a hypochondriac. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing I wanted to say, I wrote a, uh, an article in a local newspaper and I was asked what I wanted uh, people to get out of that article. And the only thing that came to my head was, we are not the walking dead. Mm -hmm. we, have, we live, we live mm -hmm. well uh, sometimes, uh, we just have difficulties. Mm -hmm. So that's all I wanted to say, thank you. Well, thanks, thanks for sharing that, Paul. Bill? Uh Similar to what Paul just said, uh, my family doctor, i have known for years, he was a neighbor of mine, and unlike Paul, I got tremendous, tremendous service uh, very quickly, and I think part of it is the fact that he was a client of mine, and I'm oh. sure he yeah. didn't want someone with a possible diagnosis of dementia doing his tax work. Yeah. <laughs> Great. That's, That's a difference awesome. between a seven and a three. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Len, tell us about your early diagnosis. How did that come about? Uh, my early diagnosis was a, um, to put it delicately, a shit show. <laughs> I was, I went into a doctor to, because I, I have difficulty with females name, female names. I have since I was a young boy. I didn't remember my sister's name. I don't remember. It took me a, a month to figure out who Myrna really was. And I liked Myrna. Myrna and I are good friends. And I had a, I had a, a, a friend that I did, dealt with for 20 years. And it finally clicked in there. And her name was Gloria. So I went to the doctor and I says, I got a little problem with, my, with, me, with this aspect of my memory. And he gave me this silly little test that was easy to complete and then he sent me to uh to a doctor at uh, a hospital for persons that were older well, i was already older but i was wasn't quite the age i'm now he told me you got dementia and he sent me to see his secretary and she gave me a pamphlet she also told me I was going to be dead within, I think it was five years. And that just made me mad. First of all, I think I, I think of myself as a fairly intelligent char char character. Char char character. Uh, I, I, I had been a television director for 30 years. I uh, had traveled the world as a television director. Um, I had seen everything, done everything, been everything. And now I was going to die really quick. I didn't like that idea at all. I was angry. I went through every stage of depression, every, day, every stage of, of, uh, of uh, dying that, that you've ever heard of. Uh, depression, anger, uh, feeling sorry for myself, et cetera, et cetera. But all of those. And then I, uh, I, I, I went to see somebody who was at the Alzheimer's Society. And she put me in touch with uh, the people at DAC, the Dementia Advocacy Canada Group. And uh, I've got information from them about a university in, in Australia that gave programs uh, in, in, in uh, understanding at dementia. Didn't tell me how to heal it. So. I knew I was still going to die, but, but no. 
I knew I also knew I wasn't going to die so quick. Yeah. <laughs> At any rate, the, the whole thing comes down to to uh, it's a, it was a horror story, and I hate to tell it. I, I can do it now with humor and with people like like uh, like Bill and, and and Myrna that I know are going to laugh. Um, but at that time, it was devastating. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Len. It is really, really hard, um, especially if you haven't even heard the word dementia other than in a book as an insane person. All of a sudden, somebody tells you that you have dementia and you go, what the hell? Uh, maybe you don't swear. Maybe you use other words, but it's pretty shocking. And it takes a long time to come. Oh, Bill used other words, I can tell, because he's laughing. Um, somebody from the audience has a question about how does one persuade the family doctor to conduct memory tests when one knows that there's something wrong about themselves, like forgetting, etc. Who would like to answer that question? Go ahead, Debbie. I wanted to say um, I had amazing health care through this journey, I will tell you. So I have no complaints, but my family doctor, like some, knew me really, really well. I aced that mini mental test. First, the first time I took it, six months later in his office, I said, there's something wrong. You know, I'm making mistakes at work. I've been asked to come here. He said, do you really think there's something wrong? And I said, yes. And I was persistent. And I said, I need to see somebody that knows. So I was sent to a geriatrician. They were able to do some more substantial testing. From there, it was a neuropsychologist, um, a psychometrist, um, a neuropsychiatrist, and then a neurologist. And it happened very quickly. It's about persistent. You know you better than anybody else. You know your body. You know that there's something going on with you. Um, a lot of people live in fear of that and don't seek the help right away. But be persistent because the earlier you can catch something, the for me, the less symptomatic because I was able to go on some medications that have really helped me focus and uh, stay productive and have a positive attitude. And I know that's not always the case with everybody because of the dementia and be besides the type of person they were a lifetime, but really be persistent. And if push comes to shove, get a second opinion. Yeah, um, many of us have no idea because we haven't had dementia before, but a referral to a gerontologist is just in my mind, the best route to go. They specialize and they know about seniors. And so it's a win-win. Sometimes it's difficult to ask your doctor or to get your doctor to agree. But as Debbie said, be persistent. Go ahead, Len. Except you're muted. <laughs> the only thing that I want to say is you have to ask. If you don't ask, you don't get. Uh, so, so the idea of going to a gerontologist or a geriatrician, geriatrician or a neurologist, all those things. Just go to the doctor and say, look, I need some help. And this is what's, what, my, what my symptoms are. And, uh, you know, let, let us deal with it. Because in, in, in many cases, people can learn how to live with this um, better if they know what it is. So uh, go do it. Yeah, for sure. Let's move along just a little bit and talk about whether it's better to keep your diagnosis um, secret or do we want to share it openly? And there's two sides to this story. Um, and I think as Sandra is going to tell you, everybody has a right to their opinion. So we must respect that. But let's talk, start with Sandra about should we, what is best? Should we stay open about our diagnosis or should we stay secretive? When I first started out after having diagnosis, I, I had I took it very badly, even though I knew it was coming. Um, I went into shock and I thought, I told the doctor, I said, I'd rather have a brain tumor. At least you can take that out. Mm -hmm. But the secretive, I was in my hermit year. I, I did, I just succumbed to it and became it. And I became worse and worse. I wouldn't tell anybody what was wrong. They just knew I was sick. And then my daughter said, my daughter 
got hold of the Alzheimer's Society and had me join up and made me realize, okay. And I, I play both sides of it. I will, I get up on stage and I will public speak and talk about it. But if it's somebody I've just met, I'm, I'm as Donna said, I'm not gonna tell them right off because the first thing they think of is, oh, I don't wanna to get to know this person stay away that you know you know I don't know what she's going to do so um I always wait I may not slip it in the conversation right away but you know I let them see who I am what I am like and then I go then I'll bring it up when when I've done something silly that you know is obvious that's not normally me and then I'll just mention oh by the way um just to let you know, I have, you know, I'm, I'm a high functioning uh, young person with dementia. And this, these little slip ups happen all the time. Mm -hmm. But so I believe there's in telling everybody, I want everybody to know about it. And I will public speak, go on TV. And I will speak to anybody about it and tell them what they want to know. Uh, no, no, I won't hold anything back. I just go out and say it. But if I'm just meeting a person who doesn't know me through any of those situations, I am, I do keep it to myself. Um, when I go on, when I go into stores and I have a problem, it's like they're asking me something and I can't grasp it. I always call, always um, have my memory card with it, with me from the Alzheimer's Society. And it just says, thank you for your patience. I have a memory impairment and may require a few extra moments. Your understanding is appreciated. I have it laminated because I use it a lot, but if I'm going to a bus or I'm in a cashier's line and there's a lineup, it's just like, do I really want, want to announce to this store that I have dementia? Do I want to freak anybody out? No. So I give it to the cashier, the bus driver, whoever. By the time they read it, it's given me enough time to collect my thoughts and almost be able to say what I was looking for. So I find it the both best of both worlds. Wow, what a great step strategy. I do that as well um, when I know I'm going to have a difficulty. Um, Donna, why do you think some people worry about whether or not they should be open or secretive? What's, what's the basis of that concern? I think it's, it's mainly just human reaction that they've seen around them with the disease up to that point. And, uh, and it, it really doesn't take you very long to find somebody in your family network that is gonna say something that they shouldn't, right? <laughs> so, so that's why I always use that. That is, it's, it's nice, it's polite. But it also is like, if you want to hear it, fine. If you don't, then it'll, I'm offering you if you ask many questions. And if you don't want to ask many questions, that's perfectly good. But, and I only say that to them when they've given me a good indication that they do want to talk about it. And then, you know, everything is fine. But, um, but yeah, I find a lot of people um, are not interested in that. That's okay. But you don't have to kick us to the curb just because you don't want to talk about it, right? So. Yeah, good for you. Mm -hmm. Len, Len, it's your turn. Unmute, please. Um, I think it's imperative that we that we advertise the fact that we have dementia mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, for two reasons. Number one, we give uh, we give people that have dementia and don't know they have it the the ability to look at somebody and say, "Well, nothing mm -hmm. wrong with him, or there's something wrong with him, but not bad. He can chose to get along, or mm -hmm. she's still cute, or whatever, whatever that is." You know, you, you give them that option. The, the second half of that is you now have people have more understanding of, of, of why you screw up once in a while. You know, I mean, it's I think it's really important that we do this for, for those two reasons, if none other. And there are a lot of other. So yeah. I don't want to. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Bill, have you ever had to deal with stigma directly and how have you handled that? Um, I have never really gone out and advertised the fact that I have a diagnosis of dementia, but at the same time, I've never hidden the fact. 
that I have the diagnosis. When I was originally diagnosed, um, I certainly made it a point of letting all the family know. Obviously, my wife knew because she was with me when we got it. Uh, but I called the kids, let them know, so forth, parents, so forth. All, all of that was taken care of. Um, the only other group, because I considered them such close friends, for the last 48 years, I have been the bass player with the bottom of the barrel in Thunder Bay here, which basically is a, um, it's a big band swing Dixieland band. Mm. And um, I made certain that I let everybody in the band know. Now, a couple of the band members are medical doctors, clients of mine, uh, Dr. Tom Herringer, who was also the chief coroner for the Thunder Bay district. Uh, he was the leader of the group who had originally put this group together. And his wife, um, when I told him about the diagnosis, Connie's only reaction was, well, be sure and let us know how it progresses because you were always a little off. <laughs> so um, I, I, as I say, I have simply never hidden it, but I've never actually gone out and advertised it. Wow. Debbie, have you ever confronted a stigma and how have you dealt with that? Yes. And the first stigma that I dealt with was my own. Good point. Because I, even though I had the history behind me and a lot of, I've always worked in healthcare and even in long term care facilities. But I have to tell you, that my, my perception of dementia went straight to end stages. Yeah. Because that's what I was used to. So again, it took 18 months. I only shared it with my church, my one sister, and oh, my coworkers, because they were really supportive when, when, I, when I was terminated from my position. But the rest of my family, and friends and everybody else I knew, colleagues, you name it, found out three years after my diagnosis when I was featured on the front page of the local newspaper. <laughs> I guess they knew then. <laughs> they knew then. Mm -hmm. And my superintendent knew too because they've always been very kind and very sweet. Um, so I, I did both sides. Today, what I know now, and I did go to the... The, the same um, uh, that Len, uh, university that Len went to, uh, I think it was the University of Tasmania. Tasmania. Yeah, the Wicking Research and Education Center. Loved it. Opened up my eyes. So I really enjoyed it. And, that's, and then I started taking the programs to the Alzheimer's Society. But now I was just looking for it. I had masks made up for uh, people in my support team and the staff at the Alzheimer's Society that says faces of dementia. Um, it says faces of dementia, um, working towards a, a dementia inclusive community. Wow. And t-shirts that said, I have Alzheimer's, it doesn't have me. Mm -hmm. I have to tell you, I tell everybody, there, is, there shouldn't be the intense fear that people have to go through when they get the diagnosis. There isn't a need for it. So everybody, my grocery store, my drug store, my bus drivers, everybody knows that I have Alzheimer's. Yeah, and it does make life um, easier. I, I could have just share a, a quick note of how, um, how stigma affected me. I was in the hospital taking exercise classes and improving my lungs. Um, and I was going to say, therefore, includes, including therefore helping my breast movement to be more better but we'll just stay with the lungs I won't mention the business about the breasts um so I was taking these exercises and the class, okay I like breasts <laughs> the class uh leader asked me if I would lead the class and to do that I just had to say okay do this exercise and let's count one two three four and a new man came in and he was standing next to me and I'm missing my numbers, right? I probably did one, three, five, whatever. It was incorrect. And the man next to me leaned over and he said, what's the matter with you? Have you got dementia or something? I was so crushed. 
that I never went back to that exercise class, even though the, the uh, medical person that was doing that class phoned me at home several times. I just was hurt to my very core and could not overcome it. And the reason that it's important to tell that story is that we're all different and we're all at different stages. And obviously the stage I was at then, I didn't feel good enough about myself. And so it really affected me. So for people that are watching, it's important um, to understand where the person living with dementia in front of you is in their journey. Let's move on to a, another topic now. Let's talk about when we have, um, we would really like to have rehabilitation as kind of a, a necessary thing. We would like to have uh, the plan like the Cancer Society offers to their patients, but we don't. So we're gonna make the best out of a, out of a, out of a sow's ear. So let's talk about when we go for some sort of supportive help. There's support groups that are run by Alzheimer's, that are run by private agencies like mine called Purple Angel Memory Support. Did you hear that? <laughs> and, and many more. But the question I'm posing is, is it better to concentrate on our cognitive issues by doing exercises with our brain at these groups? Or is it better um, to more socialize and, and, and concentrate on just living well? Let's start with Len this time. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Len Twitter. <laughs> first of all, the first thing I want to, to say is, and it kind of, kind of goes back to our last conversation. Um, I looked up demented in the, in the dictionary yeah. and it said insane. Yeah. I'm not insane. I have, I have, yeah. I have a dimension. It's a different thing. And and they, it all goes together, you know. You, you, that's why we get the the, uh, the stigma. That's why the myths are built, because of the, because of the damn word. Um, sorry, Myrna, I forgot what you asked. Um, oh, great! <laughs> so did I. Who's on topic here? Who knows what we're talking about? Bill, you do. Oh, sorry, I was writing. Um, what? Oh. <laughs> We're sorry, Lot, aren't we? <laughs> I think this is a first in history. It had to do with support groups. What, what? Oh, you're oh, so clever. Social, social, yeah. social or cognitive. Okay, he's, Len. He's so smart, that guy. <laughs> okay, do we want social or do we want cognitive? What do I want? Uh, I think that it's important that we do both. Mm -hmm. I, go to, I go to a couple of organizations and a couple of events that are both cognitive and social. At the same time, uh, I, I associate with people and we, we play mind games and we play, uh, you know, uh, figure out this, that, the other thing, sort of things. Uh, as far as the physical is concerned, we should do that too. It's called Minds in Motion. And what we we do the physical, well, not me, but because I'm crippled and can't move. <laughs> but everybody else does these exercises before we get into that social uh, a section of the program. I think they, I think they're both equally important. I'm not so sure whether from my from the what I what I've learned about the the uh, the, um, the condition that the the acting that act, the active mind part isn't isn't the most important. It uh, it uh, extends our ability to reason for a longer period for years sometimes. Uh, if we have an active mind, uh, as a, and I'm the perfect example, I'm stuck in a wheelchair, and I'm stuck at a computer, uh, 12 to 15 hours a day, but I ain't going nowhere. My brain isn't going anywhere, and I can still write books. I mean, I write books, published books. Um, as some of the, uh, by the way, I'm not, no, I'm not the only one here. Myrnus and just as, that's the same thing. There, there are other writers here. There's other people that have been in the newspaper. There's other people that do this, those kinds of things. I mean, I, I know, I'm not special. And I and that's the point. By keeping my mind active, I remain just like everybody else. Yeah. 
Good answer. Bill, since you remembered the topic the whole time, you get to go second. <laughs> well, I, I've never actually gone to a, a, an organized support group per se. Um, I suppose the closest thing to it would be things like uh, Dementia Cafe. Um, or I, I consider what we're doing here today a support group. Mm -hmm. um, I also would consider any anything that I'm involved with with either Lake University or University of Waterloo mm -hmm. as the support group. But my most immediate support group all have four legs. Yeah. And I found by going to the barn and hugging horses, uh, I always get the answers I'm looking for. And I found that 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 initially was part of my biggest support group at the time I was diagnosed. Wow. Yeah, you've told us stories. Before, before we run off from that, I I agree with Bill because because my largest I got a I have a fabulous wife. She's really supportive. But the most uh, the most supportive creature in my life are my cats. Mm -hmm. I have a I have a big male named Benson and a female named Molly, and those two animals give me more support than anybody any other person creature program in the world. Good show. What about you, uh, Sandra? My grandkids are downstairs playing, so uh, I'm hoping they won't be too loud. Um, for me, when after I was diagnosed, I, I had already had a rescue dog, and he became my most supportive person besides my children and my grandchildren uh, to help me at all times. And uh, for me, it's both playing the social, the social aspect, the cognitive. And for me, I love my hiking, so I have to be physical. When I was living at assisted living and I wasn't able to go out for my five, five K walk every day during COVID. And I declined quite a bit because that affected me more than I thought it would but yeah so that's that's for me what it is and I wish I still had my dog to this day but he did pass so Sandra you're not living in long term anymore um no I never lived in long term I was always in assisted living okay they were they were thinking about when I was at when I first got diagnosed and I took the hermit year and just became you know what everybody thinks it's almost like yeah this is this is what they say fit, you know tend to your affairs and that just means like you're gonna die they told me I was gonna die within you know seven to eight years yeah. but I think they they're thinking end stage because here I am a lot longer after seven or eight years and I'm still around and I'm still hiking and I still advocate. Sandra, so, tell us what you're doing on the weekend. Oh, um, I am going hiking in Western Vancouver Island. It's a 45 kilometer hike to, around uh, Cape Scott. It'll be half in the forest and half on the beach. Wow, we can do anything. Donna, yeah. what do you think? Cognitive or social? Social, social. Um, and why? Um, well, social um, is easier because there's um, the friends and family and stuff. Um, they're, they're all aware of uh, this disability of Alzheimer's, but um, they also are aware that every once in a while I may say something or not. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so they're, they're, and I think because they are aware of it, it just makes it more comfortable to spend time with them uh, because I find that if I'm not by myself too long, that's not good either. So, uh, you know, and I, and I think in my brain and another way for me to, to really feel better about Alzheimer's is the fact that I, I sort of look at it as, um, well, I got this disease so I could share with others who are coming along down, down the, with the pipe, right? And so that I would be um, cognitive, have enough talk, speaking skills to, to talk to them about it and let them know that it's not the end of the world, because it's not. Sometimes it's funny things happen and, and other times it's like, 
any old day of the week, right? So, but there, there is uh, situations where it gets a little crazy. And uh, my husband's standing out the, out, out the back here looking at me like, <laughs> yeah, it yeah, does get crazy. But, um, <laughs> but other than that, yeah, because you, 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 there's nothing you can do about it except the best you can. So, and that's my theory. Just keep moving along. And um, stop and help people if they need it, and if they ask questions, and and that for me is the best part. I literally like that when they ask me questions about, well, what's yeah. it like to have this, right? Yeah, and the more people that know, the better off they are too, because it's not going to get any less. We're not going to see less um, Alzheimer's. We're going to see more over the next decade or so. Yes. So, so yeah, so we have to be prepared. But yeah, so great, great, Debbie. I want to say that prior to my diagnosis, I based my lifestyle on four things. Cognitive, I didn't even know what the meaning really meant way back then. Um, physical, social, and nutritional. So when you're talking about being social and you're being cognitive, which is the more important of the two? I would say that they're equal along with proper nutrition and physical activity keeping everything going, your body, so that you're able to manage those things that come along, like imbalance. Um, I'm in a role leader now. And like Sandra, I used to hike. I was a master camper and a master hiker at Algonquin. Um, I used to walk home from uh, Oakville to Hamilton, which was an eight and a half, eight and a half hour walk, nine o'clock, depending on what, when the wind went. So, but mine is four. Mine is definitely for it. When people think when you feed your body, you're actually feeding your brain because your brain controls your body. So socially, yes, definitely. It helps the moral support, the listening ear. I have a thing that I call the, I, that we all need a heart. And if you spell heart out, in the middle of heart is ear, E-A-R. Mm -hmm. So heart to me means your heart that you give the empathy, but you give a, a listening ear. So that social component is important. Mm -hmm. Cognitive, I've always been a puzzle person. I've never owned a television in 37 years. I've always doing something, whether it's education, academic, um, general information. So keeping my mind busy, that's Every, that's what I've done my entire life. And then the physical and then the nutrition. Oh, the nutrition could have been a lot better, but I'm finding that it's really important now. So I think I, I can't compare. It's like apples and oranges. I just think it's we're, we're so interdependent mm -hmm. on the things around us, the people around us, that everything's equal to me. Good. Thank you. She's pretty hard to follow, isn't she? I just want to share with you that um, I've been doing support groups forever, um, and they help me more than they help other people. It, it's just really important. Um, and I have almost all men in my support group. And I tried at the very um, beginning of this year um, to do cognitive exercises. And my men would struggle and struggle and struggle to make the letter A or to tell me their full name or to tell me how old they were. And I found that my men were not having any joy. So I flipped the stigma over and now we go out to lunch. We go to the park for the day. Uh, we've been to a movie together. And so including that social aspect is the brain um, cognitive as well because we're using that in, to enable us to respond to each other. Um, I want to open the floor now to questions from our audience, um, and please, you can answer any questions. We're all big boys and girls here, and we're happy to answer them. Um, you could either put them in the chat line, or you can raise your hand and ask them, and we're more than happy to. This whole process is about finding that balance between those of us with dementia and our communities, and we if we weren't really wanting that to happen, we wouldn't have put this together. So, so come up with your questions. We're happy to have them. And if you don't want to ask one, make one up. <laughs> Rose, you have a question. Rose, do you have a question? I, I, I had raised my hand uh, 
at one point, but I think it was in response to your question as to whether it was, um, oh, you couldn't remember that uh, oh, yeah. the, the idea of cognitive versus uh, social. Um, I do have a question though. Um, I was I was just thinking about how, um, let's see if I can find the words to say this, <clears throat> how so many of us have faced some form of stigma uh, over the over the years and how um, some of us, you know, I think are a little shy about revealing um, that we have dementia. And um, I was like that to begin with, um, with my with my dementia, I really, um, I knew something was wrong, but I couldn't get a doctor to confirm it. And um, so I, I kept it all to myself for a long time. And it was probably Oh, at least eight years in that I, I got my diagnosis. And then um, um, it still took me a couple of years to come out with it to my extended family. You know, uh, even though I, at that point, I'd known for a good 10 years, you know, but now my attitude toward the whole thing is I want everybody to know, you know, that that is um, uh, an option for some of the uh, things that uh, they might be seeing in you um, as far as um, symptoms and all that goes. Um, you know, I think it's an evolution. You yeah. know, I think it's just part of that journey. Yeah, definitely an evolution. Yeah. And, and I still believe that um, the social aspect of um, of all of this, of finding other people that know what you're going through. Mm -hmm. That made all the difference in my life because up until that point, I was in the deepest of depressions and was also thinking of suicide as someone else mentioned here earlier. Um, but honestly, um, the social aspect has come through as being my savior in all of this, you know, and, um, that's why I'm looking into getting uh, something nationwide set up in regards to uh, dementia and all that. Um, um, I'm still looking for, you know, the, the support that I need in regards to that. But um, at the same time, I, I, I really feel like it, it's the only thing that really said anything to me at all was the groups that I've gotten involved with over the years. And, I, and I'm going to shut up now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rose. Uh, Debbie, just before yours, Miss Sri has a comment. Go ahead, dear. Hi. Um, I'm first of all, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, th thank you so much uh, for, uh, you know, I I'm really delighted to be here because uh, it's opened up a vista of ideas as well as uh, I come from a South Asian background and uh, I notice as a gerontologist that there is so much of stigma in the community. So I just want to, the first step I would like to share is when I reached out to a community organization, which caters to the South Asian diaspora and the GTA, um, they asked me when I asked them that, you know, you should kind of invite some speakers to create that awareness of dementia. Uh, it could happen to anyone, but uh, <laughs> I had a funny feedback. He asked me, uh, so how many of them do you think is affected by dementia uh, that wh whomever you come across? I said, that's not the point. The point is that we have to educate ourselves and uh, create that awareness in the society. As Canadians, we live in GTA. It could happen to anyone. It could happen to your dear one who's living miles away too, and you could advocate for them. So my question to this whole panel, anyone could um, give me some suggestions as to how do I, um, you know, try to uh, involve someone who has experienced, like so many of you have experienced, some of you are professionals in the field and you arrange certain workshops or perhaps an um, awareness uh, workshop or something if you'd like to call it. So can someone throw some light on this as to how do you get started? How do you kickstart it? 
Wow, Thank that's you. a great question. And this panel has so much information. And I'm wondering if we could um, have your email address and as well as answer it on here, send some information to you. If you could put that on the chat line, that would be really great. Because as much as you're looking for these services, we're looking to give them. So that's wonderful. Debbie? I wanted to say, um, and this is in response to what Rose was saying, and I knew the pro I know the project that she's working on, and that answers one of the questions um, on the chat that says, "What sort of services would you like the Alzheimer Society to see?" And I would suggest that that's across the board, and. Um, Rose, can you just, I'm going to ask you if you don't mind, um, if you don't mind, um, would you want to share what your thoughts are with regards to having a national uh, program and what that program is? Sure. Um, basically what it is, is I, I would like to set up in each province two, day, um, two Zoom calls every day okay one uh one at 10 o'clock and one at two o'clock um those times i'm selecting specifically because uh, many of us with dementia are either um not early risers so we're an afternoon person or we are early risers and are fresher at 10 in the morning than we are at four in the afternoon um, most of the groups that I'm, or just about all, yeah, all the groups that I'm involved in all have a time that is either four o'clock or later. And I've had people tell me again and again that they, um, they would have participated in a certain group, but because it's so late in the evening, they can't handle it. Okay, so basically, I'm, I, I'd like to use the same chat line. Uh, on Zoom and create um, a 10 to 2 in each time zone. Wow, for... that's, that's wonderful. And, you know, just merely by telling everybody here, it's going to happen. I just have all the confidence in the world that we're going to get that done. I yeah. like that because, you know, I was thinking to Myrna that when we, when we're having a bit of a crisis or we need tweaking, it's not just at a specific time and place. Um, I might have, you know, wake up. Sometimes I have what they call night terrors because of medication. And I wake up and I just can't sleep. So I just want to chat to somebody. So if I can chat to something, like if it's four o'clock in the morning and I can chat to somebody like in, you know, Nova Scotia or something, I don't mind. Well, I, I, I don't think we'll have anything at four o'clock in the morning, <laughs> but certainly if there's another time zone that suits you better. Yeah, I can just zoom into it. You can zoom into it. And I, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm hoping that people will do that. There's definitely times where I feel like I could have used somebody to talk to and there was just nothing available for me. Yeah. It's a great service that I'm sure it will come to fruition. Somebody has asked in the in the questions, um, what do we as people living with dementia need in terms of home support? Um, let's start with with uh, Len. What do you need for home support? I need uh, somebody to drive me to where I have to be. That's just about it. I mean, I I have this computer and it reaches out across the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I talk to people in Russia, uh, Germany, and Lithuania, uh, everywhere uh, through the computer. My wife is really good at cooking, uh, looks after me well, really well. I'm getting fatter and fatter. Um, uh, no, I, home, home supports, uh, I'm not, I don't think are an issue as far as I'm concerned. I, uh, I'm, I'm honest with myself. Uh, and I do only what I can do. I uh, I don't try to do things that I incapable of doing. I um, the, the last time I, I broke my foot, I have a broken foot. I got that by trying to do the weeding in the garden. So I'm I'm, I'm pretty much limited, you know. And uh, 
And I'm honest with myself as far as that's concerned. And that's the other thing. That's one of the things that I wanted to note. Don't do what you can't do. Don't try to do what you can't do. Because uh, that, that, that well is there for us to fall into. So be careful. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Sometimes when people try over and over to do a task that they are unable to do because of the dementia, it just puts us further down the road, doesn't it? So we need to do the things that we're good at. Sandra, what sort of home supports do you think are important for people with dementia? Um, there are many types of, of home supports, whether you're in assisted living like myself or long-term care or in your own home, but you have to have someone that you can talk to. You have to be able to find that person, whether it's through the first link of the Alzheimer's Society of where you live to get hooked up with them. And as Lynn said, and, and Rose and Debbie, I'm on the computer all the time. And so when I need to talk to somebody, I've got somebody out there in a time zone that they can talk to me. Um, when my best friend in, who, who, in Halifax, who also has dementia, is asleep, I know that I can call out to Rose or to Debbie or anyone, you know, anybody else. I just look at, see what time it is, and that's where I'll go. It's, it's building up your network of people. And to do that, you have to be able to go, to go outside of yourself and say, I need help. What can I do? Who can, who will talk to me? And, and if I'm not the person they need to talk to, because I don't know what it is that they're, you know, what I'm not able to help them. I will refer them to a list of, of, of places that they can go to look for the information with names of different groups or anything like that. But, um, but for home support itself, it's, you have to know what you can and can't do. You really have to be able to tell yourself, can't do this. Like I couldn't cook. I burnt every pot in my house and they were paternos several times over. I've had the nice policeman come and visit or the fire department and the police department come visit me and, and say, Sandra, you know, you really got to start looking. <laughs> and that was the other thing. <laughs> looking is going on a waiting list and I was on a waiting list for for a very long time and I finally got into an assisted living they were looking to put me into long term because I had gotten myself into into that like you told me I have dementia that's end of life but I might as well just give up and crawl in and die now but I was able to come out of that but People, for long-term care, I'm thinking they need, like the family should do something up and some places do it and some people places don't. They need a list. Tell them, my mom, my father, my uncle, aunt, whatever, likes to do this now, but he needs help. His favorite kind of music is this. His types of books he likes are this. Yeah. The movies he likes is this is this, especially if they're, you know, with dementia and they, they have a hard time talking, this will help. And especially in long-term care where turnover can be high, the new person can just look at this list of things that they like. What happens if they, you know, don't, don't, you know, don't give them a lot of options. If you ask them questions that have options, give them three or two or three, and then yeah. say, or if you have something else. So if they do have, remember something they want to do or a restaurant to go to, it can be there. Get to know your pharmacist if you're living at home. And because if you go to the same pharmacist all the time, one talk I had given to pharmacy students at their, in their last year. And I said, you know, get to know them. Are they losing weight? Before I went into uh, assisted living, I had lost a lot of weight and I, I personally did not see it. 
Yeah. Uh, I wasn't taking my meds. So my pharmacist noticed saying, you know, my doctor said, if you don't take meds, take them in. So I remember to do that. And he would call my doctor and say, Sandra's forgetting she's not taking this, this, and this. And, you know, her weight's going down and, you know, you know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so she, she, you know, because he, they knew me at that particular pharmacy, they were able to help without help me without actually saying a whole lot because they could tell my doctor because they, they'd say you lost weight and I go no I haven't and then you know it didn't hit me until after I moved that all the clothes that I brought with me were for somebody else not for me because they didn't fit me anymore yeah so there's lots of things that you just have to know and be able to ask and that's that's a hard thing for us to do in the beginning and for some people all along the way, but we have to know who we can ask and to find out who that person is. And the best part to start is with your Alzheimer's society, get, get involved with them or get the resources from them, find out people who you can talk to there and then finding people like us that will help in any way you know if yeah. you were to call nova scotia alzheimer's they would you know they would have a list of people of who you know who might be willing to help if they know what it is you're specifically looking for Go and Go ahead. You know, they will also for you know in that area if they know people that are willing to go and come and you want them to come and speak. I've spoken at um, in like uh, fraternity groups at, at universities. I've talked to the pharmacy students. I've, I've talked, you know, if someone wants me there and I'm available, I will be there, whether it's Zoom or in person. Yeah. And I think that stands for all of us that are on this panel today. Yes. In the interest of time, we have a couple more questions um, in the chat line, and I'm wondering if, Emily, you would feel comfortable tackling this one. Um, if I conduct, no, how does one cross the bridge? No, that's not it either. Okay, three times lucky. Here's the question, Emily. If dementia is in the family, should we get tested early to see if we might be predisposed to, for a diagnosis. Thank you, Carol, for that question. Emily, can you answer that, please? Yeah, thank you, Myrna. Um, I will start by saying that I am by no means a doctor or a gerontologist, so I definitely don't have uh, that background, but just based on what I've heard from, you know, partnering and working and engaging with people living with dementia, um, I feel like it, it probably couldn't hurt. Um, but like you said, I, I think if you are concerned about your memory or you're experiencing symptoms that you think might be dementia, sometimes it might be good to, to get a second opinion as well, because sometimes the first time from what I've heard, you know, it sounds like you go to the doctor and they might not necessarily, you know, kind of take you seriously or they might sort of brush you off a little bit. So, um, yeah, I don't know if anyone else could speak to that. I, again, I haven't necessarily been <laughs> been there. So, yeah, Debbie, would you like to? Yeah, yeah. I wanted I wanted to say with uh, seven family members, uh, pr private previous to my diagnosis, I um, do not have the genetic gene. There was no, there was no component. So I wanted to just caution people that if you think, you know, you have family members that have dementia, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have dementia too, or that you're predisposed. Um, with us, it was, uh, with my family, it looked like it was more environmental. They grew up on a farm. Um, but like Emily said, if you do have a concern, yes, be tested because it will it will ease your mind and take the stress off of you, okay? Um, but if you are thinking that you have it just because you have family members, that's not the case either. Thank you very much, Len. You've got your hand up. Yes, I do. Um, Lord, um, there is no genetic gene. It's something that's developed through a whole series of different things in in some cases it's stress in some cases it's drugs in some cases is drugs as a medication by the way not well maybe the other kind too 
uh, <laughs> it's it's it, through uh, operations, through shutting down your mind, through through uh, different things. Mm -hmm. It's caused by a number, a huge number of things mm -hmm. it, that lead you in, 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 in a, any one of these dimensions. So it's not uh, it's not genetic. Uh, that's the only that's the one thing the only thing I can say about it. Um, so. Uh, if you feel like you're ingested, if you think if, if you if you're doing that just because your 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 dad's got it, I don't think that's a good idea. But if you're doing it because you think you might have it, go for it. Good, thanks, Len. We're down to about eight minutes, and I have another question that's from the chat. Someone um, wants to know. If your family refuses to accept your diagnosis, how do you cope with that? And let's ask Donna that question and then Bill. Donna? Okay, well, I guess there's, <coughs> excuse me, there's so many variables that your family doesn't accept it because it did, so much of everything depends on the time of life that you are diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. So that makes a huge difference in, in care for your loved ones and all that other kind of stuff. So, um, so I think, I don't know, I, I just, uh, there just doesn't seem to be a real right answer or wrong answer for that. So, you know, as to, to what to be, what's to be done, so, yeah. Okay, thanks, Donna. Bill? I haven't personally run into that. I, I really have had none of the family refuse to accept the, the mm -hmm. fact that I have a diagnosis. But I have friends who have been diagnosed who refuse to accept that they have dementia. And as a result, many of those, and I can think of two in particular right here, and one right here in particular that I see on a regular basis, who refuses to take the medication and who is going downhill rapidly. She simply refuses to, to say that um, I couldn't possibly have this. This is something for old people, old, old people. Therefore, it can't be me. Yeah, great answer. <laughs> this is the first time I, well, second time I've kind of done this. And, um, and I think I've fallen through a few cracks because we're on for another half hour, you lucky people. We're not over at 1130. We're over at 12. Could you confirm that, Emily? Uh, we, we're going until, if we're in Ontario, we have until three o'clock yes um, so that gives us five more minutes yeah. um so i think you were right the first time Rena. Oh. <laughs> um, so yeah that. maybe any any final thoughts or any final questions would be great but em emily mern is in bc they have their own rules <laughs> <laughs> well i danced my own drummer that's for sure go ahead Len. <laughs> I, I i wanted to ask sorry i wanted to ask emily if she could take down the information in the chat line because I'm not able to. I've tried to copy it about seven times here so far today, unsuccessfully. Yeah, so, absolutely. That is one of the sort of sore points, I think, with Zoom. There's all this great information shared in chat and we can't copy and paste it. Um, yeah, but yes, right. absolutely. Along with the recording, we will have the chat transcript as well. Um, so we will make it available at the end of, you know, uh, probably within the next few days or so. Oh, you're a good person, Emily. Mm -hmm. And By the way, she's tall, she's um, tall redheaded, so you can't see. And, <laughs> and, and she's a mother. <laughs> Go ahead, Debbie. When well, you're just... looking for bony brownie points there. <laughs> I, 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 I just wanted to say that, uh, first of all, thank you for everybody coming. And uh, Myrna did ask me if I could tell a joke. Because one of the things that I think is really important is humor. Mm -hmm. and it lightens our day so every day I do look up kids jokes I tell them all the time so I'm going to tell two of them um what did one eye say to the other eye I, what I, did I, one eye say to the other eye between us something smells oh. <laughs> <laughs> I love it I love it and and then the other one is my favorite this week is what do you call a bunch of rabbits hopping backwards? What do you call a bunch of rabbits hopping, hopping backwards? backwards? A receding hairline. Oh, cute. <laughs> very good, very good. I've, I've, I've never, never heard that. I've I had, loved, I've I had one of those long gone. 
<laughs> Thank you all so very much for attending mm -hmm. this in the first of the summer series. This has been a dream of mine for a very long time. Um, and I wanted it to be set up so that there was no specific topic. Although those of us with dementia did get together and talk about some of the things we wanted to talk about, there was no firmness to this. It was what we wanted to share with you to make life for both of us better. I'm so honored by Len and Debbie and Sandra and Donna, and Donna <laughs> for agreeing to be part of this. Isn't that amazing that they have so much intestinal fortitude that they wanted to come out and help all of the rest of us learn more and learn how to share and perhaps pick up some tips. Don't forget, there's going to be two more, two more, um, two more events um, in this summer series. Um, and we're going to have, uh, hopefully, coast to coast. This time we had Donna from the Pacific Coast and Sandra from the Atlantic Coast. And then we had the, the middle of Canada represented by Debbie and Bill and Len. So I would like to keep that going in that kind of a way. I just, again, uh, will repeat that I'm so honored that um, RIA and Merip, Emily and and Danielle and Nathan, and I'm missing somebody, Jen judges that helped put this together because it took a lot of time. I wasn't able to do any of the technical stuff. So they've done all that and it couldn't be better. I hope you'll all tell two friends. Um, and so we can have this experience again in August. And I'll ask um, Emily to tell us when in August. Again, thank you to you know, it wouldn't be um, it wouldn't be a podcast if, if you people that are watching and participating hadn't come. So without an audience, uh, we can still help each other, but we want to help the whole group. Um, Emily, can you tell us when the next one is, please? Yes, absolutely. So the next panel is going to be August 10th and the following one will be August 24th. Um, so I can put that information in the chat. Um, actually, let me share my screen because we have a couple other links that um, would be good to see here. So let me just quickly share my screen. So we have um, just ways to stay connected. So feel free to follow along on Twitter. We're at Schlegel UW underscore RIA. You can also find us on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube. And for any questions, anything like that, if you want to reach out to us for any reason, info at the dash RIA.ca. And I just want to take a moment to thank you, Myrna, and to thank all of our wonderful panelists today, um, just for your time and for sharing your energy and just your enthusiasm and, and passion for helping people to better understand dementia, um, to navigate diagnosis and just living well with dementia. It, re it really is just tremendous. So thank you so much again for sharing your stories with everyone today. And um, for everyone in the audience today, we, we really hope you enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, we would encourage you to continue the conversation and to register at, for the next two panels. Um, yeah, and follow us on social media. And just a reminder again that this was recorded. So we will be sharing the recording within you know, the next few days, we'll say. Um, so please feel free to rewatch if there's anything that you wanted to watch again or to share with anyone who you think might be interested in and enjoying the conversation as well. So thank you everyone again for your time and uh, we hope to see you at the next two. Bye everyone. All Thanks right. for coming. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, we all. Thanks all. Bye now. Bye. 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 Yes. Bye. <laughs>